Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a good day, and I'm glad to welcome you back to yet another study of Scripture. My name is Daniel Rogers. You can always join me here on my YouTube channel, but you can also read some of my articles and other materials at my website, danielcrogers.substack.com. You'll find links there to all sorts of things like class handouts and articles and blogs and essays and other audio studies that I've done, such as the one you're watching now. Of course, most of that is published uh, to YouTube in the form of voiceovers as well. So we're going to be doing a study on the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in particular. And this study is going to be very similar to the study on the Holy Spirit in that we'll be posting one video every day. I'm going to change up my posting schedule just a little bit for the next two weeks. Instead of posting my regular content at 5 a.m. every day like I've been doing, I'm going to move those postings to 3 p.m. every day and keep these videos uh, at the 5 a.m. mark. So check back every day at 5 for a 10 to 15 minute video or so on 2 Corinthians chapter 3 for the next two weeks. The Daniel Bible class, the Minor Prophets Bible class, all of that will be posted every day at three. Now, just to give you a little inside scoop on Daniel and the Minor Prophets, those audios are available much sooner than YouTube. On my main website, danielr.net backslash handouts, I think is what it is. <laughs> if you go there and you hover over resources and you click uh, class handouts, you'll be able to find links to all of my classes, including up, um, updated audios to my Daniel class and the Minor Prophets class before they post to YouTube in most cases. So just want to let you know of that for those of you who like to listen a little earlier in the morning. So we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 uh, now, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3 in today's study. This is how these videos are going to go. And by the way, not every video is going to have an introduction like this. For those of you who don't like introductions, I feel your pain. Bear with me in this one video. We're going to read a passage from 2 Corinthians 3 in three versions. Scott McKnight's The Second Testament, a New Revised Standard Version, and a New American Standard Version. This means we are going from a more literal translation, so to speak, of Scripture, to a word-for-word -word translation with the New American Standard, uh, to a dynamic equivalent translation, instead of a formal equivalent like the New American Standard is, uh, with the New Revised Standard. This should give us a wide range of translations, which is what I suggest that you do in your own studies to help us glean more from the text that we might not get from just sticking to one translation or one translation philosophy, such as word for word, formal, formal equivalence, in other words, and dynamic equivalence. We're not going to be pulling from a, a paraphrase translation in uh, this particular study, but it would be good for you to do that by using something like uh, the message or the New Living Translation or the Amplified Bible or whatever uh, preferred paraphrase translation you have access to, maybe not necessarily a translation, but just a paraphrase, more of a paraphrase version so that you can get even different angles on the text. Okay. So let's take a look at second Corinthians three. We'll begin reading from the new revised standard version verses one through three. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Surely we do not need as some do letters of recommendation to you or from you. Do we, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by all. And you show that you are letter of Christ, prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets that are human hearts. Next, we'll try the, uh, the formal equivalent version, New American Standard 95 edition. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some, letters of, of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Very similar translations, by the way. Second Corinthians 3. This is in Scott McKnight's version. Are we beginning to affirm ourselves again? Or do we require, as some, affirmation letters to you or from you? You are our letter, having been written in our hearts, having been known and read by all humans, manifesting that you are Christos's letters, served by us, having been written, not with black ink, but with God's living spirit, not on stone tablets, but on fleshly heart tablets. It's pretty cool. You see why we like to use different translations in some of these more intense studies. All right. Let's talk about this idea that you are our letters. Theology 
without application doesn't really do us much good. Okay. It's fun to talk about. It is, uh, it's invigorating. I mean, I enjoy discussing scripture, but if we don't have any application to take away from it, we're not really doing much, much good. Uh, Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. And if a theology isn't bearing fruit in someone's life, what's it, what's it good for, right? <clears throat> the apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter five, that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, good theology produces love, joy, peace, long suffering, etc., in a person's life. Any eschatology that doesn't produce that fruit, any teaching that doesn't produce that fruit, any theories that don't produce that fruit, it's not from the Spirit of God. All right? There we go. So, 2 Corinthians 3 starts off with the application part of the text. And the application part of the text is this. If you understand who you are in Christ, if when you come to realize that the Spirit of God dwells within you, you understand that you are a letter of Christ written to the world. Notice he says in one sense, he says you are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by all men. That is, through your living, church at Corinth, you are proving to everyone that the Apostle Paul's ministry is valid and that his claims to apostleship are true because you are the good fruit of that ministry. That's why the Apostle Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, take care how you build because the church that a minister, the congregation, I should say, that a minister works in and works for is a testimony to the quality of his teaching, of his example, uh, of his personality, right? If a congregation is all divided and if there's constant infighting and whatnot, those things may have been going on before that particular minister arose, arose on the scene. But if it goes from peace to division after his arrival, then you wonder the quality of that particular minister. Um, now, of course, there could be divisions for other reasons. Perhaps he's calling out uh, different false teaching or false practices or something like that. That might be a different understanding. I hope you get the example. The, the, the point that I'm making here is that the morality of the church at Corinth and the theology of the church at Corinth mattered because it was a reflection on the validity of Paul's gospel and the validity of Paul's apostleship. That's what verse 2 is about. That's why he was saying we don't need letters of commendation from you, and you don't need letters of commendation from us. The fruit of the ministry serves as that commendation. Now, the second point that Paul's making here is a point that you and I uh, can really draw application from, and that is that you are a letter of Christ. As I've said before, and I'm, it's a little, it's a, co it's a common saying, especially put on a church sign, but you might say, uh, you are the only Bible that some people will ever read, right? Your life, your actions, the memes that you share on Facebook, how you talk about other people who don't agree with you, that is a reflection of the God that you serve. Now, is that God the father of Jesus, or is that God a God of your own creation? Your actions, your words, your deeds say a lot about who God is, or at least who you think that God is. It's as if you're writing epistles to everyone in your life. Every time you open your mouth, <laughs> every time you make a decision, every time you make a mistake and go out of your way to repair that mistake, that's a reflection of God's impact on your life. And that's telling the world the kind of God that you believe in, the kind of savior, the kind of Lord uh, that you bow down to. And so it's important that our lives are a reflection of who God is, as he's going to talk about in this letter. They're growing up into the image of Christ. A faith uh, that is divorced from a transformed life doesn't do the person much good, and it doesn't do the world much good. Our lives are important because we are agents of healing in the world, because it is through us that people hear about the good news of Jesus and who take on the life of Jesus, as described in Matthew chapter uh, 5 through 7, for example. All right. I think that's important. Um, I believe that if you want to be, be technical about it, that justification happens at the point of faith, right? But a, a living faith works. That is, we work from the point of justification, not to the point of justification, but we do 
work. God does expect uh, that God does expect things from us, that we will have transformed lives and that our conduct and that our uh, how we treat others will be evidence of our conversion, will be evidence of our justification. That the saying, you might say, uh, that he was justified by faith, right? Or righteousness was imputed uh, through his faith is fulfilled in our outward actions. All right. And I think that's important. I'm not talking about religious actions. I'm talking about I'm talking about how we treat, as James uses as examples of works, how we treat the poor, how we treat those who are hungry, how we treat those who are naked. That's important. We're telling the world who Christ is. We have to have a trans, a transformed life. And any living faith will produce a transformed life within a person. Okay. He says that these letters were um, cared for by us in one version. Uh, another version says prepared by us. And let's see what this version says here served by us. So he says that you're a letter that was written by the apostles, but it wasn't written with ink and it wasn't chiseled on stone, but it was written on the tablets of human hearts. Now this to me is a, is an interesting theme and he's setting us up for the next discussion. That's why we don't skip verses one through three in our studies of second Corinthians chapter three, because in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31, the prophet Jeremiah foresaw a time when a new covenant would be given to the house of Israel. I want to read to you a couple passages from Jeremiah chapter 31. This is a passage that's going to be referenced again here in a moment, the language from it at least. And it's also used in Hebrews chapter eight uh, to talk about the passing away or rather the full, you might even say the fulfillment of the old covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. Now, notice that this passage says that it would not be like the covenant that God made with Israel as they came out of the land of Egypt. I think that's significant because <clears throat> I think that's that's significant uh, because we often don't understand just how glorious or more glorious the new covenant is. We don't understand how radical the revelation of the father is in the life of Christ. Sometimes we forget that. Uh, John's gospel does an excellent job of presenting that case as well as the book of Hebrews, but we'll leave that for my eschatology of John series that you can find on my Substack, or you can find the articles read out loud here on this YouTube channel. All right. He says, but this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law within them. I'll write it on their hearts. I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Notice what he says, that he would write the covenant on their hearts. That's the imagery that Paul is drawing from in 2 Corinthians 3. You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all people. That's verse two. And then in verse three, he says, you are a letter of Christ prepared by us not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human hearts. People wonder how this would be fulfilled. Jeremiah 31. How would the covenant of God be written on the hearts of men? Well, Paul is answering that here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. The new covenant is written on the hearts of men because a faith, an active living faith in Christ transforms the person of faith into a new creation. It transforms the person so that they don't live like they used to live. They don't act like they used to act. They don't see the world in the same way that they used to see it. And their example positively influences the people around them and teaches them through their actions about who Jesus is and what God has done for them. So first lesson done. You, our, you are our epistles. You are our letters. Thank you so much for joining me in this study, this first study of the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be talking about, just one more note here, covenant eschatology. We didn't discuss that much in this chapter, but the basic premise is this. The eschatological sayings within both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament have more to do with the end of one age and the dawn of a new age, the end of one covenant and the dawn of a new covenant. And I think sometimes... Uh, there's a little bit of confusion surrounding this, so let me allow me to say this in a different way. And I know this is going to rub some people the wrong way. That's okay. The nation of Israel, from the time 
for, from the time of Genesis three, when that seed promise was gave that, that, that seed promise was given that seed, that choice, that choice seed through Seth, eventually through Abraham, and eventually even more specifically through the tribe of Judah and through David, that seed serves as a microcosm for all of humanity. What happens to Israel in the particular is what is to happen to everyone in the universal. Her covenant, her temple, her um, her priesthood, her sacrifices, anything you can think of, her feast days are pictures, are dress rehearsals for the, the human condition even outside of Israel. And so Jesus enters into his covenant people, His uh, he takes on flesh, he lives under the law, so that what is true for Israel becomes true for the world, and good news is offered to all. So when we talk about covenant eschatology, we're not talking about Israel only, we're talking about Israel and her covenant and the promises that were fulfilled on her behalf as a microcosm for the whole world, and the transformation from the old covenant to the new covenant through the ministry of Jesus and fulfilling the old covenant, not in just abrogating it or doing away with it, um, is God's way of opening up a plan of salvation, not just for his covenant people, but for whosoever will of any nation of any time. And that is considered by Paul to be one of the great mysteries in his epistles. We're going to be talking about that more, but just want to throw that out there at the outset of what exactly it is that we're talking about. Anyways, thank you so much for joining me in this first video. Hope you'll hope to see in the next where we're going to talk about this next line in uh, this chapter where Paul says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I'll see you then. God bless.